All right, can everybody hear me? Cool. All right, so today we're talking about how to get pocket or energy out of a pocket universe uh, in JavaScript. And what that really means is uh, that we're kind of talking about games. We're talking about like uh, real-time animations, things that are interactive, and things that require some performance. And the number one thing that you'll hear from people when we start talking about performance and jank and this and that is 60 frames a second, right? All of your web pages have to render at 60 frames a second because otherwise the users will see that and it'll look bad and it'll be all glitchy and stuff. That really only means that when you're in a, uh, a tight game loop or a, uh, an interactive experience, that you only have 16 milliseconds per frame to do everything you want to do uh, before the next frame has to happen. And if you take too long, then uh, that is going to... Uh, that's going to be visible on the screen. It's going to, it's going to glitch out and jank, jank out. So, if we're talking about a game, we have this thing called a game loop. And in an ideal world, maybe on like a Nintendo, what you might do is the hardware says go, you process input, you update everything, like, you know, move Mega Man to the right two pixels. You draw everything, which means you actually send all those sprites to the dedicated hardware. And then finally the hardware is like, all right, we're ready to go paint it to the actual uh, buffer and screen, and then you do it all over again. And you just keep doing that over and over and over again. And just a fun fact, um, the Nintendo, the NES, released in uh, 1985 in the US, ran at 60 frames a second, just like your phone. That's why it looks so great. Um, pretty amazing. So, what actually happens in a browser, because we're in browser land, right? We're not in hardware, is that you have all this other stuff that happens that you have no control over, okay? So you have, the, you have like delivering events, such as post message or like key presses. You have garbage collection just everywhere. Anything you do, it's going to be garbage collected, so be careful. Um, so in your game loop, you might let the browser do its thing, and hopefully you're using a request animation frame. You're going to process input, which means like, all right, I've found out that some keys were pressed or the mouse was moved or clicked or something or touches happened. Hopefully you don't spawn too much garbage. Then you're going to update your whole world. You're going to move everything around. Be careful about garbage again. You're finally going to draw everything, which just, which just tells the browser I want to draw something. It doesn't actually like hit the hardware or anything. It just gets it ready. And if you're going to do a, a DOM game or something, like using actual elements, get ready for the browser to actually calculate layout and things, which is completely uncontrollable in terms of time. So at this point, we're way past our 16 millisecond budget, and uh, you know we're not even done yet. So what, what do we do about that? Well, the current state is that you have to compromise. Okay? You have to either make your game less complex or your animation less complex, or you have to literally exclude people from experiencing it, and no one likes that. I mean, have you guys ever, how many people in the room have ever, like, loaded up a game, been like, I'm so pumped, and it's like, oh, it's not for Mac. Oh, it's not for Linux. Oh, it's not for, I don't know, Windows XP or something. Like, it's not fun. You want to experience these things. And it's also really important to remember that, like, as, as developers in a browser, we don't have control over the things that most game developers are, are just like, what? Are you serious? Like, for example, garbage collection tuning. There's no way for us to tell the browser, um, hey, wait until you've got like 100 megabytes of garbage before you actually collect it, because I know that my game will generate X amount and, and, and let's deal with that. We don't have that control. We also don't have control or like really knowledge or insight per platform into what, what's called the micro task or HTML task semantics, which are like when events are going to actually be delivered to the browser, things like key presses, things like post messages. Are they at the end of the event loop, the beginning of the, end of the event loop? Is it possible to overwhelm the event loop? What happens? And we also have no way of knowing how long something is going to take. So you give, it, you give the browser code, and you, in other environments, you can say, all right, run for this amount of time, and like, just pause yourself when, when uh, too much time has taken place. But we have no control over that without doing some very complicated things in the browser. So if you're making a game, it's kind of like you're creating a whole new world. <laughs> and um, modern computers have multiple cores, right? And it's, that means that what we can do, if we do our job appropriately, is that it's a bit like computing in parallel universes. Okay? We can create multiple copies of the world um, and then share resources and pool our resources between them. Now, any other person would probably think, well, how are we going to do that? How, how is that possible? 
How? Well, the answer is web workers. Um, web workers, for those of you who haven't heard about them, are basically hardware threads in JavaScript, but with a high-level API on top of them. And you're not necessarily guaranteed a hardware thread, but it kind of ends up mapping to that. Um, the basic idea is that you give a worker a script, or you can give it a string that contains code, and then you listen for messages from it um, using your standard browser APIs. And when a message happens, then you can, you can handle it. Now, this is super cool, but for real-time things, there are some problems because, one, uh, you have standard stuff inside of a web worker, just like you would in a normal JavaScript environment, things like set timeout, set interval, date, post message, but you don't have a DOM. So that means that any rendering that you want to do, you have to do back in the main thread or like the, the regular browser thread. And um, this will change soon. Uh, it's, I'm not sure which browser it's in right now, but it, there, are, there is this thing called um, transferable canvas coming where you can actually transfer a canvas element to a worker and have all, all the rendering happen over there. But for right now, we're kind of, we don't have that. And the other really important thing that we don't have is high performance timers. There's no way to, to get down to um, sub millisecond precision within a web worker right now uh, across uh, cross platform. And that's important when you're trying to figure out how long things are taking or, or scheduling things to be run at a certain time. So what we're going to do, and this is kind of hard to read because the, the screen is small, but we're going to have our browser thread and we're going to have our worker thread. I'm going to show you a demo in a minute, don't worry. It'll be It'll, it'll make things move. It's fine. Um, the browser thread is going to accept events from the worker. It's going to worry about input, such as keyboard and mouse and touch and stuff, sending it back to the worker. And then it's going to draw. And that's pretty much it. So we took all the stuff that we said before, and we're going to actually make all the complex stuff happen in the worker thread, such as updating the world, handling collisions, doing physics, worrying about um, maybe AI or pathfinding. And we're going to use one weird trick in a little bit, and it's gonna, we're going to even be able to double the amount of time that we have. So right now, we have expanded our world to two worlds, and we now can exploit the resources in both um, to, to have even more time. So eventually, it's going to look like this. Oh, look at all that time. Oh, it's so beautiful. It's just so much, so much time over in that web worker. And we're gonna, I'll show you how in a minute. But first, um, quick demo. So, this, I have two demos here. I have a single thread version and a multi thread version. Uh, really, it's just two threads, but um, they're sharing pretty much the exact same code. So these are not like tailored demos. Here's the single threaded version. All right, cool. We've got, um, I assume the little, the little graphs are a bit hard to see, but we've got, uh, about 40 frames a second-ish. Uh, that's the yellow number. And we have a lot of other statistics here that I can get into later. But for right now, there it is. This is a very basic demo. Also keep in mind with these demos, um, I purposefully did not optimize the graphics. I did not optimize the physics. Like, I'm colliding everything with everything because I'm trying to benchmark the kind of like uh, multi-threaded machinery, not the actual, oh, my collisions are so efficient and I'm using a this and a this and a sorted hash and, you know, whatever. So that's that. Okay, we're going to pause that. And now here's the multi-threaded version. And you can see because we have both worlds running, it pretty much stays right around 60 frames a second um, using the same, pretty much the same code. The only difference uh, are just a few few differences that I'll get into in a moment. So it does drop once things kind of co coalesce, and every once in a while it still dips, but like, pretty cool. We got two things happening um, in separate places, and it's all synchronized and smooth, and it looks pretty cool. All right. So now how, how does that work? So there's a few key pieces. The first one is what I'm calling just shared code. Um, I'm using Browserify and WebWorkerify to let you just take code from, uh, you know, everywhere, require it wherever it's needed, and uh, it works really well. So the difference between the two files that power this thing are that in the multi-threaded one, you pass the code into a worker, and in the single one, you just call the code. The other difference is that in the worker itself, when it's not actually running in a worker, um, it does some specific things. 
And when it is running a worker, it uh, does some other specific things. And those are just whether or not to use post message or whether to do something else uh, for transport. And that's, that's pretty much it. And if, in fact, if I show you, here is the single threaded code. It shouldn't be highlighted. Here is the multi threaded code. And if I go back and forth, there's like some little differences, okay? Mostly with right here. And if I scroll the way down to the bottom, you're, you're gonna you're gonna kind of laugh because it's just really like exactly the same. <laughs> so it's it's basically the same code, and this is possible because of again uh, Browserify and WebWorkify letting me just have a completely isomorphic API. So there's a, a some more parts to this too. Uh, one is an entity system. An entity system for those of you who haven't heard of it, uh, because it's kind of a game specific thing. It's basically just a factory. You give something an ID, um, or you request for something with an ID, and it gives you back an item with that ID, whether it exists or not. You can kind of abstract this to any, you know, if anyone's built a web application <laughs> where you uh, ask for something from the database, you ask for a record from the database by an ID, and it gives you back that record. That's what this does. And the cool thing is that you don't have to have an instance. Um, you just ask for a string ID. And this is how, when a message is passed from the worker back to the main thread, we, we're not like wrangling instances around. I just have to say, give me this ID and then apply this data to it. And I'll show you how we apply the data in a moment. So that application of data is called, is something I'm calling a snapshot. And this is a technique that I literally stole from Doom 3. If you've ever read the source code, well, sorry, I have not read the source code of Doom 3. Um, but other people have, and they've written about it. And you should read it. I have some links on the, on the project for this. And uh, you, sh you should read it, because it's really cool to see how other people make these really complex systems. So a snapshot. It's just a way to represent an entity um, in your game or whatever without having to define a custom data type. So there's two important methods here, read from snapshot and write to a snapshot. When we read from a snapshot, we accept data into the entity, and that then becomes the entity's data. When we write to a snapshot, we just take the state of the entity and write it to another object. And I'm just using plain objects. So there's nothing special here. We're not converting to a string, but you can kind of think of it as serializing an object. And here's an example of uh, if my dog were, a, uh, were an object in my game here, or my like demo here. He's a corgi. And the important things are that he has some data, data properties here. He's got a name. He's got a property that is, is seasonally shedding and a fur level, and everything always has an ID. So when we, when we request to read or write to the snapshot, we just accept data. This is like the one manual part of this concept. And then uh, each of these is basically only going to be called from one of the threads. The main thread, which is doing rendering, is really just a read-only thread. So it reads the data in, and then it draws. The worker thread is calling write to snapshot once it updates the entity to actually send the data out. And then it also calls update once, uh, you know, just to like update the state of this thing. So this, you know, like my dog is just, is just always shedding. Like I can't, I can't handle the shedding because I vacuum like all the time and there's just always more hair. So fur level just always keeps updating, always updating, updating. And then new snapshots of fur just keep flying out basically. And this is what that looks like. The worker is going to emit these snapshots every, uh, every 33 milliseconds. It's going to update the whole world and then just say, all right, every single thing in the world, write a snapshot and send one big message full of these snapshots out. Um, just so you know, if you ever decide to use web workers, don't, uh, don't send a lot of messages over the web worker bus or like the event bus. Browsers don't like it. You will quickly just overwhelm the whole thing, and uh, your browser will slow to a crawl. If you want to, just sending a message like from one from your main thread to the to the worker thread and then back, and then just doing that will actually overwhelm some browsers. If you just never give it a chance to uh, to um, to pause, and then this is what the main thread looks a bit like. It just listens for messages, and when it has them, um, it's running in a loop. Every time a request animation frame fires, it reads in the snapshots, applies them to everything in the world, and then draws everything. 
And the, the, that's, that's pretty much it. The one abstraction I did here was to make sure that when a message comes in, because uh, Web Worker's message API is asynchronous, so when a message comes in, rather than just executing the code that would handle that message immediately, such as updating all the, all the circles and things, I queue the message so that I can handle it when I want to. And the reason I did this was mostly just for performance and being able to monitor, not performance, but being able to monitor the performance of the, of the demo to know like, how things are, are, are going. Because if you just have events coming in, you have no way of, of knowing if they came in this time that you're doing your loop for rendering, or the previous time, or the next time. And so you lose a little bit of that control that you need for a very tight simulation. Now, if you were paying attention, which I, I don't know why you would, frankly. But this, the worker is running at 33 milliseconds. That means every 33 milliseconds, it's emitting a new set of snapshots, a new state of the world. It's telling its, its other universe, I'm here, I exist, and here's what happened since you last talked to me. It's lonely over here. But if you recall, our render thread is going every 16 milliseconds because it's going at 60 frames a second. If you, just, if you do the math, it ends up being 60 frames a second versus 30 frames, half. And if you think about it, that doesn't make any sense because how could we be drawing things before they actually happen? If one thing is only updating half as often, then who cares if we draw twice as often? Because drawing twice as often means you're just drawing the same thing. You're just going boom, boom, and then an update comes, you're going boom, boom, an update comes, boom, boom. So what's the point of that? Well, here's first of all what that looks like, just to make it very clear what I'm talking about. Internet, don't fail me. Yes, OK. So this is an example of a little circle going at uh, 60 frames a second, rendering 60 frames a second, but it's only being updated every 100 milliseconds. So you can clearly see it jittering because there's not enough new data to actually render. Nothing is actually changing. However, if we use, if we all become time travelers for a moment, and we use this cool thing called interpolation, which you've all probably used, but maybe not have thought about. Um, interpolation is just taking a point A and a point B and then making time steps between those to figure out the transition between those two states. Um, and if you've ever used CSS animations, or if you've ever used jQuery Animate, or really any of the animation frameworks on the web these days, this is how they do it. So what we do is we have these snapshots, these things that are being emitted. We always hang on to the last two, the newest one and the one before. This is probably my most complicated slide, so don't worry about it. This is this one, I got a little nutty with this diagram. but. But basically, the idea is that we're always rendering one step in the past. We're rendering one step behind of reality. So we're, we're taking, all right, we are X amount of time past when we last received a snapshot. And that's represented here where it says, um, worker is here, this part right here. That's where real time is. And this distance, we take that and apply it to the previous snapshot, the previous two snapshots, and then we render at this point. So we render appropriately, but just one step behind. And here's what that looks like. So the top one, once again, is doing the same thing it did before, rendering at 100 milliseconds um, between time steps. The one at the bottom is just interpolating. It's the exact same code, the exact same data, but there's just one little tweak, which is that when we're actually rendering, we're rendering one step behind. So you can actually see the blue ball chasing the green ball because it's just a little bit behind. We're actually rendering the past. And you might be like, whoa, 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 this is not real time anymore. This is way in the past. This is horrible. How could you do this to me? This is a lie. And the answer is that, well, every game you've ever played is lying to you because they all do this. Um, they all render uh, up to um, 100 milliseconds behind what you're actually seeing. Or they render 100 milliseconds like in the future from what you Anyway, it's basically like there's a delay built in so that there's time to compensate for network latency, time to compensate for your controller latency, time to compensate for the delay between uh, when your PS3 says render and the, and the electrons go through the freaking HDMI cable and get decoded, because that introduces lag as well. So they build these things in and uh, build it into the game. So, I'm going to close that. 
So that's how we can only have the worker running periodically, but have rendering happening in real time and still get that 60 frames a second feel. And when doing something like this, you know, you kind of you, you kind of ask why, right? You're probably all wondering, like, why would I do this? Why why would you try to do something like this? And the answer is is just because I I one night I was like I wonder. I wonder, and then uh, a long time later I I had this demo, but sometimes it's fun to just completely completely break things and see what happens. So I'm going to set this up to run at uh, uh, 2,000 circles, okay. And let's just see what happens. Let's see what happens. You can probably all guess, but in the single-threaded mode... Okay, here we go. Yeah. It's awesome. I'm going to stop it now, and when you see the graph actually start moving, that's when it actually got the message to stop. Give it a minute. Wait for it. Yeah, there we go. Okay, so uh, it's hard to describe there, but basically what happened was that it started off fine, and then it got a little bit behind, and then it got a little more behind, and then it just kept getting more behind, kept getting more behind, until eventually there, were, there was, if you look at down here, it's hard to see, but this basically says um, that there were, I think, yeah, 14 seconds between each update. Okay, because it got so far behind. That's why it took so long for it to respond to my input. And while you know this is really a bigger problem with the, with whatever game you're doing, if you're if you have this problem, this is this is a problem. You should not ship something like this. But the important thing is that the browser was completely unresponsive. There's no way for the user to even state, "Whoa, whoa, stop this! My 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 computer can't handle this." So let's go to the multi-threaded version. Hey, not bad. Now, this is partially an illusion. It looks like it's rendering like awesomely. Well, not awesomely. It's all jittery and, and, and janky. But it looks like it's working pretty well. But it's actually a lie. If you look down here, you'll see that it's actually taking um, four seconds to compute each update for the physics. This is way too slow uh, to be in real time. Um, but the important thing is that my graph is still working and my browser is still responsive. So I can stop this and it pretty much immediately stopped. Okay? The graph is still rendering because it's on a separate, separate update loop just for demonstration purposes. But you saw it immediately stop. So that's where something like this could be applied um, is really just taking it uh, and figuring out how to keep the browser uh, responsive. So that, that is um, it's pretty much it. All this stuff is online. All of it's in a GitHub repo. It's all, it's called multi-threaded game example. Um, I did it because why not? If I said anything that's like really crazy and you're like, no, 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 that guy, that guy's, that guy's full of crap, then you should ask me about it or tell me about it um, or help me not be full of crap. <laughs> um, and uh, I think that's it. So thank you very much.